Okay, let me see which microphone I'm going to be using. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to th thank the uh, Sitcom Academy for officially declaring me old. I guess that comes with her territory. I'm, so I'm delighted and honored, obviously, to be here, first time in person. I'm, one of the other things that wasn't mentioned is one of the things that I had to do was Bishal Mizra was to uh, organize Sitcom 2020, which, as you can guess, for those of you who haven't been there, didn't quite go the way that we had originally planned, but maybe we'll make up for that. So this morning, I'm going to give you a slightly different perspective, which hopefully reflects a bit of my, shall we call it, unconventional uh, career trajectory in that. So I'm kind of to look beyond where we look from one of the newest disciplines of computer science, network engineering, not so new anymore, but relatively speaking new in the canon of computer science, to literally the oldest discipline of engineering, namely civil engineering, dating back to days of Romans or whatever else you want, wherever else you want to put it. So I'm trying to make a few points this morning. First of all, and this came up during the uh, PC discussion already, is networking really is currently four broad fields. I'm only going to talk about one of those, so many of the things that I'm going to say don't really apply to the others, so take that into consideration. My thesis is that networking the civil infrastructure part is civil infrastructure engineering. We should think of it that way. We can learn from other disciplines if we do that. And we can probably explain why things work or sometimes don't work if we think of it as civil infrastructure engineering. And has been alluded to on a number of occasions, we are no longer the youngest discipline in computer science. And that also has certain consequences that we need to think about as we move forward. One of my things that I've done uh, along the way in the voice of my IP realm uh, primarily is participate extensively in standard setting. I want to talk a little bit about what some of the opportunities are there still as we become a more mature discipline in that and encourage particularly younger members here of the audience uh, to consider that as a way of contributing. And an important consideration, as we are no longer kind of a young discipline where the outside world forgives us for our mistakes, just like they might for a 15 or 16 year old that is doing stupid things, we no longer get that. We need to think about how we can become a discipline that is at least as responsible as machine learning and AI. I know that may not be a high bar. I, the other problem, or the other issue that we'll have to face is that at least in the United States, and I believe in Europe, networking is no longer the hot discipline. We have been surpassed in particular by machine learning, and I'll talk about this, what that might mean, but I also see that as an opportunity, simply because internet and networking, broadly speaking, is now so central to everyone both in the personal realm as well as in a realm of dealing with the consequences. We need to think, and we have an opportunity to think much more broadly than simply teaching about, yes, TCP congestion control, and maybe submit a paper to that to SICOM. There's an opportunity here to think more widely simply because we are a unique discipline within computer science that affects everybody on an almost hourly basis. Again, uh, my broad classification, and it, you can disagree with that, whether it's four or five or some other number, but roughly speaking, uh, I believe based on both the techniques, economic consideration, the incentives, the administration of these systems, and so on, we can broadly talk about four disciplines that just happen to be represented in conferences and journals, but are actually quite different. I will be talking exclusively about the infrastructure side. Think wide area networks, access networks, 4G, 5G, 6G type uh, wireless cellular network, that type of stuff. 
we have data center networks, then we have the physical layer type of things, generally uh, in the um, 5G, 6G type of realm, and kind of a newest arrival using sensing uh, as a side effect of our communication system. I believe that we should treat with the respect that it deserves networking as a core civil infrastructure. This is the definition of the core civil infrastructure uh, that my, my civil engineering program is that it goes along electric power, oil, gas, water, wastewater, communication, and then probably more traditional one, uh, transportation, and so on. In particular, because it is the part of infrastructure that supports social interaction, we saw this during uh, the height of the uh, corona epidemic, and economic development. We are the core infrastructure. All of these core infrastructures, kind of the water, energy, transportation, and so on, communication, share a number of facets that explain, I believe, what we're seeing in networking research on that side. They're constructed literally over generations. We are now kind of into the second generation, or maybe even sometimes the third generation of networking researchers, but truly they're going to be constructed over generations. Much of the infrastructure, say, that we use for access networks was constructed in the 1980s, a generation or two ago. We don't tend to replace these infrastructure, but evolve them. They're interdependent components. I that can't be replaced independently. And while these systems have a high initial cost, those costs are actually dwarf by the cost of maintaining and operating those. I'll get back to that. Indeed, this has been recognized at the highest level, for example, even back in 2014, President Obama recognized that communication was one of the critical infrastructures that deserves special attention. One of the things that has changed is while, say, other infrastructures are largely independent, the rail network and the water network pretty much don't need to know a whole lot about each other. The internet and communication is unique that today every single one of these other networks depends on communication and cannot function without it. So even something as old and mundane as a oil pipeline, as happened with a continental pipeline in the United States, ceased to function not because there was a pipeline break, but because a ransomware attack interfered with a network operation of controlling this particular infrastructure. So communication is actually the critical infrastructure because none of the other modern versions of those infrastructures can function without it. And increasingly, those infrastructure support functions in communication are no longer separate networks, but they at least rely partially on the public internet for cost and other reasons. All of these infrastructures have typically a characteristic, sometimes more visible in a, in a number of ones, uh, of having a central interface, a central component uh, that we recognize as the waste of the hourglass in the protocol stack that connect two parts of the industry, the producing wholesale content, whatever side, on one side and the consumer user side in that. For the electric grid, this is the humble electric outlet that we're all familiar with in various guises. Indeed, the North American version of that has not changed essentially since 1915. That means that also illustrates that these type of artifacts, even though we could build a much better electric plug today, are almost impossible to change because it's good enough. So if we complain that we cannot replace, say, IP by ICN or IPv4 by IPv6, well, we shouldn't be surprised simply because other core infrastructures have a century on us to do that and have not managed to do that. Civil engineers can also teach us something else. Besides safety, civil engineers care primarily about reliability and cost. 
Not so much about new functions. Water pipes pretty much do the same thing they did in Roman days. Uh, in that. But they care that they're reliable because people complain when they don't work. They don't realize or care that they do work. You just assume that the electricity is on, water comes out of a tap, and so on. And this is true for networking as well. Don't care about functions. They care about cost and reliability. And indeed, you see that uh, if you look at when people look up internet reliability, steadily increasing, or now that um, loss of a application, social media application in this case, is literally front page news. However, we still have a long way to go. For those of us who grew up a little bit in the bell days, kind of the telephone days that I started out in, five nines, uh, a reliability of 99.999%, about five minutes a year of outage, was the design criteria. That's what you worked on. Whether it was achieved, leave that aside. Networks, are unfortunately, access networks in particular, are nowhere near that level of reliability. We are still straining to get about two and a half nines of reliability, uh, at least in the United States. In that. And yes, it's not just the access network, it's also DNS. It's always DNS. So let me talk a little bit about economics. I know it showed up very low in the graph for submissions, and I believe that is a mistake. As I said, in a maturing infrastructure field, cost is the second big criterion. And what, when I first looked at it, didn't quite realize is when we talk about, as networking researchers, we talk about routers and radio access networks and so on, typically physical artifacts, software and hardware in that. But that only makes up a tiny fraction of the cost of operating networks. Indeed, across both wired and wireless networks, it's only about 15% is what's known as capital expenditure, long-term expenditures, uh, amortizable long time periods uh, in that. Even that 15%, only a tiny fraction of that, total of about 4%, is actually equipment. The rest is hard hats doing their thing, stringing wires, climbing towers, that type of thing in that. So we operate indirectly, if you think about hardware and software, we have just a sliver of the total cost, meaning also that the attention paid is not that large. However, if we think of ourselves as optimizing the cost of operating networks, then we suddenly have a much larger claim to that 85%. Part of that is advertising and other things that we have nothing to do with. But we should think of ourselves not optimizing that sliver of 4%, but really a large part of that 85%. Indeed, you could argue that in one slide, this explains why, for example, traditional quality of service metrics um, measures never took off, simply because they tended to decrease by a little bit the 4%, but they potentially increase significantly the complexity and cost of operating networks. No surprise that industry wasn't terribly interested. So when we look at our classical protocol stack, we tend to focus a little bit on performance, but most of the performance gains are done at the physical layer. We can't really claim much credit unless we work at the physical layer uh, for what happens on speed increases between 3G, 4G, and 5G, for example, in excusable speed. That's all done by the electrical engineers, largely speaking. So the performance improvement is we can at best not subtract performance. But what we can do in middle and higher layers is reduce the cost of operations and across the layers, yes, and this includes the political and financial layers, to increase the reliability of a network. That is our core challenge as a discipline. Civil engineers share another facet with us. They rely on standards. Now, they mostly performance standards. We tend to think of interoperability standards in that. There's also, however, and this is a purely instrumental version, if you like, is that implementers, as much as we regret that, don't tend to read our papers, whether published at SICOM or in other conferences. They do, 
and they have to, read the standards that define what happens. So the standards have become, as you well know, the means of transmission and impact in many parts of computer uh, of networking, particularly the more applied parts. We all bemoan that the good ideas published here and elsewhere don't make it into industrial practice. So this is well-named valley of death uh, that affects technologies, where technologies never make it out of the academic world into the industrial implementation world. I believe that standards are actually one way to achieve that transition, simply because it lowers the risk and the cost of evaluation for uh, the industrial side. We tend to think of standards, if we think of them as all, I quoted some random piece from email description and of course the last textbook as a single document. That is no longer and was, hasn't really been accurate. We should think of standards as ecosystems that evolve over time. So, and they can be quite complex. So this is the um, EPC specification for 4G. Uh, 5G version doesn't look much simpler. Uh, with each of the numbers being one interface, often enc encompassing many standards inside. The session initiation protocol that I worked on, while it is core defined in one document, it is actually, even in one working group, there's 75 documents that define various facets of that. Standards have both become less visible and more visible. Less visible in the sense that the new standards in the Internet Engineering Task Force, for those of you not familiar with standards, that's the body that makes most of the core non-physical layer standards and non-web standards, kind of everything in the middle, if you like, uh, and uh, it has decreased simply because the world has matured in networking. We have kind of a good enough ecosystem in that. And we now have the situation that, at least at some layers, there's really only one company, and you get to guess which one that is, that can change, for example, the transport layer away from TCP, as it happens, uh, and that. And uh, that application layer, and this has happened in voice of IP and multimedia, is that the easy downloadability of applications and the reduction to essentially four platforms has made it much more challenging to deploy standards. The incentives are lower. So on the one hand, we see a decrease in importance, but on the other hand, and this is from an article of a former boss of mine I, who at the FCC, that Things that nobody cared about a few years ago, namely the election of the president of the ITU, kind of the granddaddy of all telecom standards organizations, is now a high-level political thing because this is seen as a possible transition, some of you have heard about new IP, as a non-quote Western standard for uh, the internet. So if we look at standards, we've had a few new ones. WebRTC, I, that related to things I worked on, TLS, new version, quick as kind of a TCP replacement. But we also have had um, challenges that I think deserve rejuvenation by this community, technical community in that. Much of the energy seems to be flowing to Web3 uh, type of things. That's where a lot of semi-standards work is going on uh, in that. I guess you have to standardize how you cheat people, um, too. So um, we've really had no new applications since Voice of IP that's been standardized. It's really the last. This is 20 years ago now. Uh, in that. And we all know that we all use Zoom largely, which is semi kind of not standard. So from a part practical perspective, this is my word of encouragement, particularly for younger members of a community, to consider engaging with that. Now, the academic engagement at the IETF is relatively low, but 5 to 8 percent, but it's not that hard. Um, I started as a graduate student uh, to participate uh, in that. Uh, online participation is relatively easy on mailing lists and uh, meetings nowadays. You have Internet Research Task Force, which is more of an academic type of discussion. And in particular, you get really good, maybe not all of them polite, despite I mean, they do need more cares in that community, I do admit that, um, is feedback on ideas uh, in that. 
So even if your work never gets published as an RFC or never gets widely adopted, you'll get much more feedback and implementation feedback than you might on a paper or not. And indeed, um, it is easier to publish a single author standard in the standards body than it is to publish a single author sitcom paper. I'd also see as an opportunity that there are areas of networking that we tend not to pay attention to, but are tremendously important. I'll pick two examples. Uh, the energy sector that I alluded to earlier runs on a completely different set of applications uh, in that. The medical sector runs on a different set of applications uh, in that. We are no longer the young crowd. When I started in the 1990s, it was the question, can you do video over the internet? At what quality? Uh, can you do it on my phone? And nowadays, it is, can you do it at reasonable cost, and why isn't it working? So clearly, the objectives in many applications have shifted. Indeed, many of the things that we see as new actually existed about a generation ago. Again, um, Alan talked about the notion of things being particular in the early 90s, being particularly fertile for our PhDs, but I would argue it was even more so for in the early 1990s that many of the things that we now take as core network services and applications first emerged during that time period. Whether that was Wi-Fi, web browsers, mobile devices, smart mobile phones, and version, versions of that, video, all of these things happened in a matter of a few years in the early 1990s. Indeed, if we look at what we teach our undergraduates, it hasn't changed all that much. This is a copy out of the, 2020, of the first edition of the Corosa Ross textbooks that many of us use to teach our undergraduate or um, first year master's students in that. If you accidentally or you were too cheap to use the most eighth edition or whatever they have right now uh, in that and study for your exam, you'd probably still pass because much of it is still valuable and, and hasn't really changed 20 years ago. Indeed, this is my first IETF meeting that I attended, uh, and many of the working groups are still there. There's change has been slower than it might seem at an occasion. We have also now reached a level of complexity that might be a hindrance to new entrants in the field. When I started, one of the things was the internet was so much simpler. You had these five VSS voice switches that had millions of lights of code. There was a whole building in Naperville that was just designed with programmers to maintain them. And now our routers have the same five to 10 million lines of code that a five VSS switch had uh, in the 1980s. Indeed, simple protocols, about as simple as you get, send a query in, get a response back, known as DNS, now has dozens of RFCs that describe it. The complexity has reached us as well. Not surprising, but that's what's happened. And what has changed is, compared to the early 1990s, it, that traditional carriers are no longer doing a lot of research. With apologies for those of you who are here from carriers, but if you look at purely the numbers, the amount of money as a portion of the revenue that is spent is just much, much lower than it is for the equipment providers, the relatively small handful that are still left, and obviously the hyperscalers. I want to now focus on a different angle, namely with the impact that we've had as a community, both those here and those preceding us, comes a tremendous responsibility. We like to claim credit for that, but we also, I think, have to look beyond this. So some of you may have seen these honest government ads on YouTube. So maybe we should all have, and I should have, an honest version of my bio. And if I were to put that, is one of my contributions, is that 100% of robocalls that some of you are getting, particularly in the United States, use a protocol that I worked on. Now, again, I'm not going to put that in my bio, but I, it is a good illustration on what happens when good intentions get abused. So voice of IP succeeded for a number of reasons. It became too cheap to meter, 
Uh, distance no longer mattered. It was not regulated. People convinced the FCC and other bodies not to do that. Mistake, but let that aside. Uh, it relied on open source software. Uh, it became programmable, and it became widely accessible. All seemed like good things, but they were all ideal breeding grounds for those who are sending us 85 calls about our expired car warranties, too. But they are illustration also that as we are trying to tackle it, it wasn't or isn't being tackled purely by technology, by various authentication standards, but it really taking technology combined with law and regulation, operations at the carriers and law enforcement to try to put a dent into this scourge. So it is an illustration that you can't just rely that technology isn't going to fix this type of problem. To take a somewhat higher level view is we like to, and rightfully do, take a credit for all the good things. This is SICOM 2020, the remote audience, uh, using telehealth, Wikipedia, whatever, all network-enabled applications. And we like to uh, tackle bad things that seem like we should do something about unwanted communication, violations of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, those are relatively easy, technically interesting problems, but the bad actors are well identified. We don't know them personally, hopefully, but we do not have to worry that they sit in the audience at the same conference. Uh, and, that. and we can tackle things of lack of reliability or usability. Those are hard problems, but they're relatively well-defined problems. We're now reaching the wicked problems the types of problems that don't lend themselves to simple solutions that have contradictory objectives that often involve both technology and policy and politics and economics and all that. And in this case, we've met the problem. And the problem sponsors our conferences and hires our students. So this makes it much harder. We worry about the end of democracy enabled by social media. We worry about deindustrialization and all these other things which are directly caused by uh, networking. And indeed, we're starting to see that not everybody likes our network product. Smart cities aren't universally popular. Web3 is having a checkered reputation in both as a network, global networked application. Um, vehicular networks have been struggling for 20 years to get traction. Now, you could argue we are just kind of the equivalent of civil engineers designing concrete structures. What's that our responsibility? With hindsight, that type of attitude didn't age well. It didn't age well for civil engineers, and they're probably not going to age well for us. But we're just building tools. What are we supposed to do? If people use our tools. Somebody else's problem uh, in that. If you haven't listened to the song, look, look up that song uh, in that. Even in legal theory, there is, however, a concept, the but-for concept, namely that if you or what you do, if a bad thing wouldn't have happened but for what you did, then you're responsible. Indeed, many of the things that we credit the internet for are indeed exactly the things that make them so dangerous uh, in the wrong hands. The any digital content, ubiquity in time and space, amplification, all of these things are things that the telephone network didn't do. We're, if we were just a packet-based replacement of a telephone network, we wouldn't have to worry about those. We're not, and so we do. We have, rightfully, an emphasis on individualized ethics, both in publishing and research, but also, more broadly speaking, most universities teach ethics courses to incoming computer scientists or engineers in that. So ACM has a code of ethics, which you can read. So we do things like test machine learning systems for bias. As protocol engineers, we're now taught use encryption and good authentication for everything, make systems accessible to people with disabilities in that. However, unfortunately, and even doing these good things does not solve many of the wicked problems. Unbiased machine learning doesn't necessarily mean it's going to preserve democracy. Encryption does not mean privacy. Uh, and accessible systems may not be inclusive. So the notion that we can just nerd harder on the encryption side and solve these problems is, I think, short-sighted.
we don't want to be the ones who say, yeah, we cycle a few more cans and that will solve global warming. And I believe, again, civil engineers can teach us something. Namely, the first line of the ethics for civil engineers is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, enhance the quality of life for humanity. Those are, I think, good objectives for us as civil engineers as well. Now, one of the things that I learned was when I got, had done much of the technical work for Voice of IP is that it became now a public policy concern. I got involved with a, the FCC because I have worked on uh, 911, 112 emergency calls uh, that I um, used the standards I worked on. And so we now have an opportunity, for some of us at least, maybe not all of us, to be much more active contributors to solving some of those wicked problems. You can do this in person. I strongly recommend that students consider internships outside the classical employers. Gover most governments have opportunities for engineering interns. You just have to look for that opportunity. Or to contribute input to that. And the only reason I put that up is that one of the contributors to a filing to the Federal Communications Commission on broadband labels happens to be an undergraduate student. So you don't have to be all that senior to be a contributor. I also believe we should think more broadly beyond individualized effects what responsible networking would look like. In AI, that is becoming now at least an area where people are starting to think about it. Does it mean robust, explainable, uh, ethical, and efficient? Is it more than that? In networking, I think we're just starting, and I believe we should be starting that discussion simply because just simply doing kind of not violating IRB, institutional review board thing, is no longer sufficient to do ethical computing. I want to conclude by looking at the next generation of networkers. I mean, we have, in the United States and North America, a development that does not look all that great. So this is the number of PhD fraction. Uh, that the, uh, the red line is networking, uh, the yellow line are uh, uh, networking and operating system, the blue line is um, artificial intelligence machine learning. In that. We used to generate about, in North America again, uh, about 10% of all PhD graduates were networkers. Now it is roughly less than half of that. And this also means that faculty hiring is no longer what it was. In 2021, among the 170 or so departments that grant PhDs in North America, um, in the uh, United States and Canada, only four uh, networking PhD students were hired as tenure track faculty uh, in that. That is much, much less than it used to be. If you look at the master's level, it looks even more dire. Uh, among the thousand or so master's students that are enrolled at Columbia University, uh, we have about 0.4% network system students in that. Again, I'm not a healthy ratio. This is not new. Um, infrastructure is not necessarily a student attractor. Uh, power systems had the same problem starting in the 1980s where that led to difficulties of hiring qualified um, staff for the electric utilities, for example. So I believe we need to take this as an opportunity, make this as attractive as possible, but we have to recognize that fewer students may want to do networking, but all with some qualification need to understand how networks work at some broad level. The current model is we teach details of networking in our core networking course, but most of our students don't take what I would see as kind of the core requirements for distributed systems, operating system networks, distributed systems itself, and security, that they need to build reliable and secure systems. Should we think about restructuring our undergraduate master's curriculum so that everybody has the foundations to do that Yes, that may mean they may not know the difference between Reno and Tahoe and TCP. We teach digital and computer literacy to undergraduate, even high school students. We need to, I believe, talk about internet literacy, and that means understanding how the internet works in some way. At a base level, technically, just the basics, but also who governs the internet, if anybody. Who can change it in various ways, politically and technically? 
How do think cork things like advertising work, which often underlies many of the conundrums that we face? What exactly is privacy beyond just encryption? What are platforms? What is common carriage, other concepts that we might have? So I've been trying to teach a course to non-majors, if you want, people who are not doing networking research in the classical sense, in that, that encompasses many of these topics, but we also meet with regulators and congressional staff to talk about their challenges in, in, in dealing with the consequences of networking uh, for real uh, life, if you want. I want to conclude by thanking uh, those people who have accompanied me along the way. First of all, I want to thank my mentors uh, at various both academic institutions uh, and in particular also at the Federal Communications Commission and in Senator Ron Wyden's office where I worked uh, most recently uh, in that. And my particular thanks to my two PhD advisors who probably didn't realize that they both instilled a love of multimedia networking but as well as a sense of obligation to uh, looking beyond just the technology onto its societal implications and who have lived, both lived that. And finally, all the collaborators and co-authors who I had the honor and privilege of working with, um, and in particular also my wife who has been the inspiration for thinking about ethics and other concerns as well. And with that, I hope I'll have triggered some disagreement and questions that we may or may not have time to get to. Thank you. You can go, whichever one makes sense to you. I'm happy to moderate, but I know. We'll see. Uh, Arman Fayed, uh, the nascent Cloudflare research, um, so, so Henik, one wonderful. I walked in a little bit of a skeptic and, and increasingly convinced over the duration of the talk, and I want to give you, maybe you in the room two things to reiterate what you're talking about. Having jumped from the academic side to the industry side of research, uh, the success that we've had in actually deploying new research tends to always be tied to cost. And a, and, a, and a really great example of this is looking at congestion control in which you might say, oh look, I've increased my total throughput, but at the cost of maybe wasted bits, and in many parts of the world, the interconnection and the pricing policies mean that you probably want to avoid running certain congestion control algorithms, and this is the trade-off of sort of performance and yep. performance, big difference. Um, and on the responsibility side, one that I think is worth looking at, and it, particularly important because it's not individual is this notion of ECH. I'm a big champion of the idea. This encrypts the last remaining clear text bits in the, in the SNI, in the TLS fields, in the headers. And, and my concern now increasingly engaged with policy and community is that the best possible outcome of something like ECH is that we further divide the income gap in the world between low income and high income regions. People who adopt it and people who don't. Yep. Yeah, and as you pointed out, it makes it a wicked problem simply because there isn't a single optimization you can do. Uh, it's like, well, you just have some objective function and you crank and you can show that it gets closer to the optimum. And uh, But that also makes it challenging. I mean, the real world is like that. We've had the luxury of kind of just m moving towards a single curve. We no longer have that luxury. And so, yeah, you all, I mean, these are all good examples of that. Uh, Henning, uh, thanks for the talk. So I think you gave a, an early version of the MDA, so some MDA is not surprising. For what's new today, the Bruce and Brighton flashed a slide where economics not only got only four submissions, but was the only topic with a zero acceptance rate. <laughs> All right, so you kept talking about cost and economics, and uh, a number of people tried to do work, but it never got really traction in the CCOM community. So what, what do you think, why is it happening and within how it can be changed. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the last. Uh, uh, why is it happening? Why economics doesn't get traction in the CCOM or other networking research communities? And what can be done about changing it? Yep, and it's hard because until relatively recently, 
uh, like for example, wi even wireless networking, for example, in Mansikom community had a harder time getting traction simply because it's harder to evaluate. Um, I'd say economics in particular faces a challenge that it is often, in order to say something useful, it has to generalize, which means we can always pick things that it doesn't model. Uh, we are used to abstractions in our own world, but we are less used to abstractions and simplifications outside our own world. So we just say, well, this is too simple. This is not reflecting reality. It's, you're missing this. But then the model is no longer all that interesting. It's just kind of just some random data, just ma applying machine learning to some data set type of stuff. So I think part of a challenge, and I've had this, I've worked with a lot of economists on, at the Federal Communications Commission, and we've had a lot of discussions on how to accurately model networks in that. Part of a difficulty also is, and this was alluded to, I think, in the Enter Women, uh, I saw a slide on Facebook on that, is the data availability. Much of the data that we have that would be interesting economic data is not available to us. Uh, carriers in particular are very reluctant to reveal what they spend their money on beyond just very bare bones type of three or four items, including, like I mentioned there. So it is really difficult to, good, to do good quantitative data-driven economic work as opposed to just theory kind of modeling work. And I would encourage in particular the data-driven work is where it particularly me because we just don't understand well what do, where does all this money go? Where are optimization possibilities? Where do we th do things that we shouldn't be doing on this? Uh, and I mean, why don't networks get deployed, for example, as the previous question alluded to, in lower income countries or even in rural areas in the United States or in Europe? Uh, and that what are the economic hindrances in there and what are economic incentives that can work there. There's a lot of interesting work that gets done, but it is largely invisible to this community. It happens elsewhere. It happens in the economics conferences. Um, I will be presenting at a conference called TPSC, Technology Policy Research Conf Telecom Policy Research Conference, in a month or so. Uh, there's almost no overlap between this community and that community. And that's, in some sense, I think both are um, could benefit from much more mutual engagement. Uh, <coughs> Henning, congratulations again. Uh, great talk. So I have a, you put a four layers of networking, and if, I'm just uh, wondering, um, you know, one of the things you should put up there, reliability is most important, but usually the, one of the things that we experience <coughs> with the New York Times, you know, Facebook's down. Zoom is not working. So I think one of the things that you know, one of the things I think the community should be very, very proud of is we build the world's largest distributed systems first. The internet scale system, BGP is that system, DNS is that system. They still have reliability problems, and we, we should continue to work on that. Then there's internet scale applications, right? This is the Skype, this is the, the um, say, the internet broadcasting systems. This is the, so th this is Zooms, right? So I'm wondering, is that part of your sort of uh, uh, your layer four, um, or you view that, because this is between the political layer and the sort of TCP layer, right? This is, a, I think, the internet scale applications, both at the infrastructure level, BGP, DNS, and at the application level, is something I think we can continue to innovate as critical problems we need to solve. Just yeah. love to hear your thoughts. And I think what you allude to is a slow recognition, this is certainly applies to me as well, is we tend to think of reliability as primarily the job of two protocols, TCP to deal with um, packet loss and BGP to deal with link loss, my links getting lost. And that is no longer, it doesn't mean it's not important, but it's no longer where most of the problems are. And so what I think are particularly helpful is that we often, and this is true at the consumer level, we don't have good invisibility. I mean, we all serve, in many of our roles, we probably, every one of us serves as tech support to somebody else, whether that's our parents, our siblings, um, maybe others in our company, whatever happens to be, informally and formally. 
and it's largely diagnostics, namely figuring out why isn't this working? Is it indeed DNS? Is it some Wi-Fi issue? Is it some other cloud issue? Is it a firewall going berserk? Whatever it happens to do be, we have very poor visibility into the system. And indeed, if you look at, again, taking the analogy to electric utilities, they have had the same problem. They often didn't know 10, 20 years ago why the lights weren't on. They didn't even know where the lights were on or off. And they've had to struggle and still struggle with visibility. So I think the biggest difference that we can make is to think of this as a whole stack visibility one and then optimizing where these failures occur. Um, I had to look at a lot of 911 failures when I was at the Federal Communications Commission, and it was none of them were classical routing failures. Many of them weren't even hardware failures. They typically were um, undiscovered security, suddenly shots of your own network type of failures, similar type of things that we just don't have good visibility into or good experience with. So I think there's a real opportunity to look beyond kind of routing and TCP as, yep, they'll take care of congestion. They'll, they'll hide, so to say, the imperfections of a network. That's no longer where the unreliability happens to be, I believe. Uh, hello, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned uh, that the standards are not a document but an ecosystem. Which was a comment I really like. I've been looking into the ITF uh, standards production, finding that uh, the ITF is becoming increasingly chatty. Similar amount of people participate. Number of uh, emails exchange uh, has increased a lot. Uh, number of people per standard uh, per, uh, per RFC has increased. Uh, number of drafts, uh, duration of the draft, uh, duration from the beginning to the end. And I was wondering, what does that tell us about this ecosystem? Uh, are we hitting a bottleneck? We have just mature, and the problems are very difficult to solve. We're in the middle of a wave, wondering what your views are. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I see all the, I mean, all the things that you mentioned are taking place and are making it more challenging. Uh, and partially, this is, I believe, one part of it is that there is a generational transition happening. Um, and we haven't quite completed that. We kind of, there's still a lot of people around who are, well, started out in the 1990s, early 2000s. What the IETF needs is some new, uh, my younger people who are not necessarily encumbered by the same discussions uh, that were taking place then, and may have some new energy as well uh, in that. There's now a generational transition happening, and it's not happening all that successfully. Uh, so I do see that as challenging uh, because, and this, I mean, this used to be kind of what was alluded to in the, uh, my TPC discussions as to there used to be a model of can you find fault with uh, whatever paper you were reviewing, and now the model is for internet drafts as well. I mean, what's all wrong with it, as opposed to if we publish it, are we better off than if we don't publish it? And that model still seems to, um, that still requires work. It's the other problem that the IETF and other standards bodies have is that many of the people there are, um, are not necessarily network researchers or network. They, they often come to standardization in a somewhat different route. And so they need the balance of people who understand the technology at a more in-depth level than some of the people who are basically standards people um, who now are sent by the dozens by large corporations who want to make sure that their IP, and I'm talking about intellectual property, not the protocol, uh, get, makes it into a standard. So that is, I think, a challenge. And we can complain about it or we can do something about it because without the technical community, you're going to see more about what you see, what you describe correctly. Hi, Annie. Here, Danny. So nice talk, and, and I buy the state that you described. We are no kids anymore, and we are grown up, and we have to take responsibility. But what about the fun? We went here because it was fun. It was like you know, breaking, doing new things, having fun. And now you say, okay, be mature. You know, care about your kids, care about the community. You know, be responsible. What happens to fun? And and students wants to do fun things. Yeah, so I would correct what you say 
I mean, I would take it slightly differently because I've seen that uh, myself. Is um, so this summer I was teaching uh, Barnard students. This is we, um, Columbia affiliated women's college, and I had young undergraduates, uh, junior, I mean, sophomores and juniors uh, in there. They had never done anything with networking. I gave them a problem related, or two problems related to access to networks. This is more on the economic side, access to network for low income households in the United States and for mental health. They really got into that because they could see how you could take network technology and apply it to real social problems uh, in that. So it was, and yes, they had fun. They told me that. And they said, this was one of the most fun projects we did. It wasn't fun in the sense there were no games involved. It was slogging through gigantic government data sets. So it wasn't fun in the entertainment sense. But they got tremendous, say, based on what they told me, tremendous satisfaction. They could see, hey, the network can actually not just be used for Instagram and for whatever, I mean, kind of for fun applications, but for things that seem meaningful, that seem to make a difference. So I think there is a unmet need beyond just kind of what you might, what we might think of traditionally as fun, uh, in meaningful engagement, uh, where students find these examples motivating, and they're willing to engage with the harder issues as well. They're not naive. Uh, they've seen it. They've grown up in the shaming on Instagram world type of thing. They're not. They're probably more familiar with the drawbacks of internet culture than those of us who may not hang out on Instagram and similar. Uh, social media quite as much anymore uh, in that. So yeah, I do see this as an opportunity to look at applications uh, that actually are motivating to students because students are looking for these type of things uh, in that. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I actually see this as more than just grinding and talking about um, whatever relatively boring stuff in the moment. That, then once you get students interested in that, then we'll obviously have to do some of the hard work to make it work as well on the technical side. Uh, thanks, Henning. Uh, the analogy to civil engineering is uh, very, very thought-provoking. But uh, here's a funny question. <laughs> so the, if I look at my, depart my sort of colleagues in civil engineering, from a, to a first order approximation, they've become applied machine learning or applied sensing people. So that's it. All of civil engineering is applied sensing and applied ML, nothing else. So if you were to simulate the future of this conference or this community, is that where we are heading? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not trying to idealize like civil engineers as some non-fashion driven community that isn't subject to the same kind of pressures of publications and, and so on as all engineering disciplines or all uh, academic disciplines are, and yes, it's certainly true. So I was thinking really, if you like, less of the academic part of civil engineering as of the professional part of civil engineering, which actually in some sense are somewhat disjoint. Again, this is not unfamiliar to us as a community if we're honest about it. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, so we should, uh, yes, and there is the danger that civil engineering is just applying machine learning to whatever the newest thing is, and we obviously have, to some extent, I would have liked to see a graph of the papers accepted over time, and, or at least submitted, maybe accepted as a different matter, maybe they're all kind of well below that um, diagonal there, um, but the ones that use AI and machine learning techniques, and that, that is a separate and important discussion, but yes, I hear exactly what you're saying. And it's partially also, and they so, I mean, they have the same problems of data availability uh, that we have as a community, that many of the interesting systems, unless you work for a large company, we don't get the data. Several engineers have the same issues, so it's easier to generate artificial data and crank your favorite machine learning algorithm across it and all of that, so, yep. Maybe that's another challenge that uh, we'll both should, I mean, both communities should discuss because they're not that disjoined. Hi, Henning. Okay, I have the honor of asking the last question. I operate a network for a government agency, so uh, you can understand some of the context I'm coming in. What I face is that the network operators, 
the network protocol developers and companies and the network academics uh, don't have similar experience. The, what I face operating a network is not something that is understood well by academics. And even the people that develop the protocols that ITF produces have no idea how a network actually operates. Yep. And so how do you bri bridge that gap? Because then I think they're working on problems that are not close to me. And you talk about some economic problems and cost problems and operation problems where the costs go that they don't have an understanding because they never operate the networks. Yep, and that's a hard one uh, to solve because there is this kind of mutual, I wouldn't call it distrust, but mutual, they won't care about us anyway. As in like, my, my sense is when network operators have largely given up on the academic community because they just don't seem to be problems that they look at. I mean, they look at the papers as the output and it doesn't seem all that relevant to what, they, what their problems are. And vice versa, it's been difficult, and this is partially maybe your ne network is, is different. I've tried to get people to, who have some insight into operations to talk to like my students or talk to, invite them to conferences and all that. And they usually, for understandable reasons, not all that interested in airing their dirty laundry uh, in semi-public. Uh, because a lot of what happens is basically admitting we're doing things we know we shouldn't be doing, as in they're not really best current practice, or they're just kind of what we can do because of limitations that were imposed in that. Uh, and we don't have a good way to bridge that. What I do see is that there are newer type of networks. So, in, uh, and the slides will be available. Uh, in that, and I had a few backup slides. So one of the things that I've been looking at is they're now public networks that publish a lot more about the internal operation. They actually give you breakdowns of exactly what they spend their money on. Uh, so there are opportunities to work with public networks who may not have the same constraints as if they don't feel like uh, shareholders may not like when somebody as that dirty laundry out there, uh, because it may make our network seem less sophisticated than the shareholder presentation made it seem like. Um, and so that is, but it's a long struggle uh, to make that. And I don't have a magic, this is all we need to do. Um, I, I will say something. I mean, most of the students who, who are sitting here, you will work for a, quote, vendor of some sort. You won't, well, just by probability, you will end up in a non-academic environment. If you recognize from your PhD or other research work what the gaps are, as you assume responsibility in those companies, it is then your job not to forget what you learned in your PhD or other program and actually start working with improving that and, and calculate. And this is one way I think, again, the civil engineering community has a more of a tradition of openness, often forced by government mandates than by in internal inclination, um, to disclose things that might not actually be uh, always favorable because you're trying to improve as opposed to that. The problem that I see is another analogy I like to use is that carriers have in many ways, and apologies for those of you who are at a carrier, become like airlines, that they largely operate equipment that they had very little say beyond the seat color uh, to design, um, that are largely not doing, like I mentioned, research in the classical sense anymore, and that are largely not able to shape, again, this is I know there are some networks that are exceptions. Uh, what they do, they don't program. They largely rely on contractors to do the software development and all of that. That makes it much harder to do that transition. And again, the civil engineering community faces some of the same issues that many of these think, the construction companies and whatever, they are largely consumers downstream of others and are somewhat at their mercy. Um, how to resolve that, I don't know. Uh, but something we need to at least think about how we can better couple uh, the, these three communities, the vendor community of hardware software, the operations community, and the research community uh, in that, and do this deliberately as opposed to making it just kind of happen by individual initiative. <laughs>